from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. And so now I'd like to introduce James Glick. Uh, we've both been in the science writing game for quite a while, uh, and I don't think we met uh, before today, although we may have passed each other on 246th Street as I was walking to Horace Mann and he was walking to Riverdale, which are two neighboring uh, fierce competitor, we hate everybody at Riverdale kinds of place, you know, high school. Anyway. All right, that's your, is that the surprise? That's the surprise, yeah, okay. Um, uh, Jim was born in and New York we, City. And we haven't changed a bit. Ah, oh, good. Well, I should make for, <laughs> Jim was born in 19, uh, arrived in New York in 1954 when he was born. I arrived there a year earlier. Uh, he graduated from Harvard College in 1976. He founded the Met founded Metropolis, an alternate weekly newspaper in Minneapolis, right? Yeah. Then he worked for the New York Times as an editor and reporter for 10 years, and then he became a fantastic author. His first book, Chaos, was a National uh, Book Award and Pulitzer Prize finalist and a huge bestseller. Um, he was also the author of The Information, A History, A Theory, A Flood, and his other books include the best-selling biographies, Genius, The Life and Science of Richard Feynman, and Isaac Newton. And believe me, it's hard to top Richard Feynman in his own writing, so it's quite a, quite a note to be doing that, as well as Faster and What Just Happened. They've been translated into 30 languages. And for some years, he's he wrote the Fast Forward column in the New York Times, and today we'll be talking about his new book, Time Travel, and he'll be available downstairs um, I guess you guys know where that is now, but it's way down after the sign after this session to sign books if you want. And I thought where I, where I'd start is you know I kind of wondered you've been uh, writing about thinking about talking about I presume time for quite a long long time in your your life, and um, I was wondering you know when that started and and then I came across the answer on a footnote <laughs> um, on the bottom of page two hundred and forty four. Oh, no, no. uh, of the book. I think this was just a test to see if I really read it. But um, you're talking again is what is time is the, is the question. And uh, the book grapples with that in many ways, which, which we'll, back, we'll go back and, and describe. But um, uh, one of the answers, Samuel Johnson said the measure of duration, and then Jim writes, and duration question mark, continuance, length of time. A 1960 children's book trimmed the definition to a single word. Time is when. Oh, that's interesting, but there's a little asterisk there. And I look, and the asterisk says, Beth Glick, Time is When, Chicago, Rand McNally, 1960, the present author's mother. <laughs> so I figured you came by this interest honestly, as they say. Um, well, I, I should recommend Time is When now. I should, I should pitch that. Mm -hmm. um, 1960, so I was six years old. And yes, my mother wrote a children's book called Time is When. It was meant to explain to children what time is. And I, as I remember, there's, there are days, there are hours, there are minutes. What if you're a kid, what can you do in a minute? And, um, but I didn't really make a direct connection in my mind between that book and the time travel book. It mm. just, it did come to me and I did put that in. I okay. put that in the footnote. I, I was only trying to make the point that this has been an, a, a theme we could trace back to your early days. I've written about time in time, you know, well, you can't write about anything without writing about time. Mm -hmm. You can, certainly can't write about science without writing about time. So there are bits about time in probably all my books, but, um, but time travel sort of came out of the blue for me. I mean, it's not like I was working up to it. Mm -hmm. It's not like I ever thought I, thought I would get around to that. It mm -hmm. was more of a sudden, there was a sudden thing that I realized that made me think there was a book here. And? And so I should say what that is. It was, it's sort of the starting point of the book. It was the discovery, the discovery that that the idea of time travel in our culture didn't start until H.G. Wells wrote The Time Machine in 1895. I, I, I read that and I'm, I, I'm, I'm a stunned, but. I'm, and I'm glad you're stunned, because I was stunned. And I think 
And a lot of people, I think maybe there are people in the audience right now who are saying, no, that can't be true. I mean, I hope there are. I hope you're saying that can't possibly be true because, because it, feels, it feels weird. I mean, it feels, um, it feels as though time travel is such a natural idea. It's such, a, such an obvious fantasy to have. Doesn't everybody think at one time or another in our lives, what if I could get into a machine or walk through a magic door or just wake up and see what the future would be like, or go back and meet somebody famous in the past. Or, you know, we've seen all of the fantasies working themselves out in popular culture. You know, meet your parents when they were teenagers. People really didn't have this fantasy, and so, so I thought maybe it would be worth exploring why that hadn't happened before and what kind of change was taking place in the way people were thinking about time to make this a natural kind of entertainment. Yeah. And now I'm wondering, was Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's court prior to that? But that was like, it was it an was act prior. prior. And uh, yeah, that's a, good, that's a good point. It was about four or five years before. You, you all, do you re all remember Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's court? Our hero, who I think is the narrator of the book, mm -hmm. Is he the narrator? He I gets, can't remember. His he, method of time travel, though, is not a machine. It's he gets conked on the head. And then he wakes up, and he's in a field. <laughs> and he mm -hmm. discovers. And um, I love this bit of dialogue, this Mark Twain bit of dialogue. There's, there's a you know, knight on a horse. And our, our guy, who's an engineer, wakes up, and he says, he points to the town down, you know, it, it, off in the distance, and he says, Hartford? Mm -hmm. And the answer is Camelot. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's, but that fits into my theory, which I haven't expressed, mm -hmm. but part of my theory has to do with developments in technology, and, and Mark Twain was fascinated by technology. He was the first guy he knew to own, own a typewriter. Um, and his, his story is very much about the diff about it's it's very much about making readers think about how different the technology of the late 19th century is from the technology of Arthurian England because his hero goes back and he's got all of this magic you know he's got i for, you know does he have a a flint i think a mm. flint he has gunpowder mm -hmm. He becomes basically king of the world. And, and he's, he was, well, he's he able becomes, to predict a, a solar eclipse. That was a big one. Exactly. So, um, yeah, it's part of the same, even though he predates H.G. Wells and it is a kind of time travel, it's time travel by being bonked on the head and maybe he wakes up at the end of the book and the whole thing was a dream. Right. So, so you said there's a theory. Is the theory that this notion it was tied to the technological developments, or maybe you could articulate that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, theory it may, might be a little bit of an overstatement, but I know it's my overstatement. But it, I, I try to explore what it's about, and I think one of the things that it's clearly about is how suddenly technology was changing rapidly. And for most of human history, technology developed very slowly. And when technology was developing slowly, you didn't, it didn't occur to you to think, what's the world going to be like for my grandchildren? Because the world was going to be the same for your grandchildren. But now England had been through the Industrial Revolution, and there were all these marvelous things around, and railroads steaming across the landscape, and telegraph was dramatically changing the way people lived. And you could see there was a, a, an awareness that people had that machines could change the way you lived, could really alter social intercourse, communication, financial life, you name it. And um, so as the 19th century was ending and there was this great calendar date coming, the turn of the century, 
lots of people were suddenly fantasizing about what the future would bring. And so there was H.G. Wells and a young man, you know, young writer struggling to make a living. And there's a, it was a natural fantasy for him, even though he turned out not to be in the time machine, especially optimistic. <laughs> yeah. So that's the kicking off point. Um, but it, the book goes on to explore the consequences of that quite a bit. I mean, that, that's uh, the, the sort of the, maybe you're making the point that now that it's part of our landscape, um, we don't think about its origins, but now that it's part of our landscape, we think about it a lot and it, it shows up in popular culture a lot. And it certainly was showing up, we were just talking before the event started about science fiction. And that's the staple of, I mean, maybe there was no science fiction before H.G. Wells. I'm not sure, Jules Verne, I can't remember. There was Jules Verne. There was stuff, there was the beginning of, sci of fantasizing about space travel mm -hmm. and Jules Verne had also had submarines, of mm -hmm. course. But, I mean, you seem fascinated with the, the inherent contradictions and possibilities and possibilities that, uh, that, that came up. Um, what, why, what's the, what's the re interest in speculating on that? Yeah, I, I mean, that's, you're right, that's the real reason for writing the book is, is not why didn't they have it before, but what are we doing with it now? Mm -hmm. and, and I do have, I do have a sense that, well, first of all, you and I both, we both read some science fiction when we were kids, and, it, and I remember thinking most of the science fiction I read had nothing to do with time travel, there was a lot of space travel. When I was a teenage boy, there were a lot of stories about teenage boys running off and you know, getting into spaceships and having adventures. But occasionally there would be some kind of time travel science fiction, and those were always the weirdest, the most mind-twisting, um, logical puzzles. They really made you, they made you think. In a way, they were the most fun. And so part of the idea of my book is to explore the way these themes developed, not just in science fiction, but also in literature, in the rest of the culture. Now I'm digressing a little, but um, soon after H.G. Wells, almost contemporaneously, Marcel Proust was, um, performing a kind of time travel in, in, in search of lost time mm -hmm. and thinking about memory and talking about time in a way that's very, that sounds very much like the way science fiction writers now talk about time. And James Joyce played with time and Virginia Woolf played with time. And people started to play with time as they do today, as we all do in our fantasies and in our interactions with the world in very smart and sophisticated ways. And all of this stuff, I don't mean to claim that, that either H.G. Wells or science fiction writers in general are leading us, but they're certainly, if not leading us, they're doing something in parallel with the rest of the culture. And the, and the whole culture has been for this whole past century thinking about time in more and more complicated and interesting ways. Yeah. And I was just th thinking as you were saying it, I want, it's probably doesn't, doesn't um, parse this clearly, but I wonder if science fiction writers, when they write about time travel, tend to write about what's going forward and literary people tend to write about what's going backward. Well, that's interesting. I mean, maybe we should, let's have a, can we have a show of hands? Uh, here's, the, here's the question. You've got a time machine, you get one trip, you are guaranteed that you get to return safely, and you can go into the past or the future. How many people are going to the future? And how many people are going to the past? Okay, mm, yeah. that looks about 50-50. Yeah. Now, I've heard it theorized, I don't endorse this theory that, and I don't have a new judgment based on these hands. I've, some people have suggested that men like to go to the future and women like to go to the past. Hmm. I don't know. <laughs> and you're suggesting maybe that the literary folk are more well, past I, oriented? I, mean, I don't know if you can make it generalizable that way, but 
the minute you start writing about the future as a serious author, you're called a science fiction writer. And that's tr I, that's right. And that's so true. Even though some of these science fiction pieces are very literary in the way they're written, but um, I, I think also the conundrums that you talk about in the book, and I hope you'll describe a couple of them that occur when you go into the past, are are somehow more delicious because right. you wind up. I mean, there's that's the where, one. That's where you get into trouble. That's where you get into trouble, which is you know if you can go back and and uh, prevent Hitler, that's the that's the classic from being born. Uh, could, could you prevent the Holocaust? And the question is, is, there, is, it, <laughs> is it possible to change time or are we stuck with it? And if we are stuck with it, how can, well, you, you explain. <laughs> well, first, you made, a, you made a really interesting point, I think, that, that for, for whatever reason, we tend to label fiction writers who write about the future as science fiction writers and genre writers, whereas if you write about the past, that's more likely to be accepted as, as literary fiction. And, and this, this argument about genre versus literary fiction, I have a feeling it might be being played out in other rooms at this festival <laughs> while it goes on. And personally, my own feeling is some of the greatest, most magnificent writers of our time are writing about the future, and it's better not to draw bright lines. Mm -hmm. I don't believe in these categories mm -hmm. myself. It is, you're right, going into the past is where the paradoxes, the, the logical paradoxes begin, where the, where the fun begins, because you can meet yourself, and what if you meet yourself? I mean, already that's sort of a paradox. What's going on there? Are you, which one of them is you? I, I mean, there's this great, uh, I discuss it in the book, a little bit, a, an early science fiction story by Robert Heinlein, By Your Bootstraps, where that's the joke. The hero keeps meeting himself, and he's only it's only a couple of days, and at first he's a little slow to catch on that this new guy coming through the hole in the air in the room is himself, and then they get into fights, and that, then there are three of them, and so on. And it's, um, it's a farce, you know. Um, and then, but there's always an arms race, you know, in fiction, because once that's done, then the, the next person has to top that. And pretty early on, you have people wondering about what if you kill an ancestor, and the canonical ancestor, for whatever reason, is the grandfather. So it's called the grandfather paradox. And then you have people actually having sex with people and giving birth to themselves. <laughs> and, and then there are, tran very early, there are transgender versions of this so that people are their own fathers and mothers. Um, this is, you know, long before transgender uh, studies became a, a worthwhile subject. The science fiction writers were there first. <laughs> and as far as I can tell, completely judgment free. Yeah. But, but weird things happen, and so weird that in all of the time travel stories and movies that you think of, once they get into these paradoxes, you sort of think, there has to be a trick. There's no, if you think about it too hard, it can't really be working, because time travel isn't really possible, is it? Maybe we could have a show of hands on that. If you're, yes, if you are visiting from the future, mm -hmm. reveal yourself now. I, I guess we're all visiting from the past, if you want to think about we're it. We're all visiting way. from the past. <laughs> um, I was hoping, actually, and I, I guess you've already in, indicated that there's no resolution here, but after watching a movie like um, X-Men, Days of Future Past, or whatever it's called, or the or the even the Back to the Future movies, my kids would get into these heroic arguments about that's not possible. Yes, it is. No, it's not. I mean, is there a logical right and wrong to these conundrums going backwards, or do you just you can pick any outcome you like because it's impossible? I I've kind of now I'm vacillating. I I could answer that question definitively. I give you my opinion. My opinion is. Time travel is not really possible. I know that's a that is a terrible thing for me to be saying. Probably 
half of the people who were about to buy my book are now not going to. <laughs> um, but it'll help also, you sharpen your arguments if you buy the book, because you, know, you have to know what the other side is thinking. It's also true that um, it's also true that when you talk to physicists, um, it's quite possible to get into a serious discussion with physicists today about the grandfather paradox. And if not literally the, the possibility of going back with a handgun and popping the guy, um, the, physic, the physics equivalents of that, are there ways in which there could be loops in time, causal loops? And if physicists aren't quite willing to rule that out, then, then you have to ask yourself, who am I to rule it out? You know, they're, the, they're the experts. And it's also a part of that story, I feel strongly, is that physicists and philosophers are growing up and living in the same culture as the rest of us, and they're reading the same stories. And if they are pondering these paradoxes and these logical difficulties from the point of view of a specialized and well-equipped kind of science, all the better. So there isn't, as I'm not willing to give a definitive answer. Mm -hmm. I'm willing to say any kid who is arguing about it is thinking along productive lines. Yeah, yeah. What, what is, um, th the other thing that you bring up uh, fairly early on, and I think it's very thought provoking, is they talk about the time as being the f fourth dimension, uh, uh, where there's space and then there's time, and then you get into the whole question of whether space is an emergent property of time, which you bring up. But, but, but the idea that we can't perceive the fourth dimension because we're in a three-dimensional world is a little bit like the book Flatland, where yeah. the people in the plane couldn't imagine, on a plain surface, couldn't imagine that there was anything sticking up. Um, you talk about the possibility of being able to create a world, as it were, that could see all those, all four dimensions at the same time. Um, talk a little bit about that. We're kind of going back to the beginning again. We're going back to H.G. Wells because in 1895, H.G. Wells starts his story in this way. His, not his narrator, but his hero, who doesn't even have a name in the book, he's called the Time Traveler, gathers his, his such an old fashioned way of writing. His, he's in his, house in London and he gathers his friends around and he says, I've had a little adventure and I'm going to tell you about it, but first I have to explain a few things to, to you. And he gives them a lecture on science. And the lecture begins by, with this notion of the fourth dimension. He says, I'm going to tell you, let's talk about geometry. Everything they taught you about geometry in school is wrong. They taught you that there are only three dimensions, length, breadth, and height. And his friends say, well, yes, of course, there are only three dimensions. And he says, no, think about it. Isn't duration also a dimension? And they go on like that. And it's 1895. It's 10 years later that Einstein and his teacher, Minkowski, put forward the notion of space-time as a four-dimensional continuum. And explain to us that it's extremely productive for, for physicists to think, in, think of the universe in terms of four dimensions in which time is just like the other three dimensions. Mathematically, it's treated the same way. And that means that mathematically speaking, there's no difference in the equations between the past and the future. And this is you know, pretty mind boggling in 1905 and for the generation that followed, and to this day. But what's going on? Is H.G. Wells somehow intuiting the new science of relativity before Einstein? Mm -hmm. I am not suggesting that, mm -hmm. because H.G. Wells, as I said, a young man, really didn't, he didn't know anything. He didn't even study physics, really. He did have some background in science, mm -hmm. but it was mostly about geology. Um, 
Is it just a coincidence? It can't be a coincidence. I don't, I don't believe in that. Um, so there was something in the air. And one of the things that was in the air you mentioned was Flatland. I don't know how many of you know that book. It's uh, 1870s, 1880s. It's, I don't know if it was for kids, but it's readable by kids. And it's a sort of fantasy about two-dimensional creatures trying to wrap their minds around the idea of a third dimension. And we as three-dimensional creatures have the advantage over them. And so the question is, could there be a fourth spatial dimension that is as difficult for us to imagine as the third dimension is for them. Well, you know, we leap ahead more than 100 years, and we know that physicists are very happy to talk about not just for the fourth dimension of time, but where necessary or where it's useful, they'll talk about five dimensions or 12 dimensions, many dimensions. And uh, I, I think it's fair to say that we're still in the same position of not being able to visualize that. Hmm. I won't ask for hands, but but not many people can even visualize a fourth spatial dimension. You can almost fake yourself into thinking you can visualize it, or I can. But that's my limit. Twelve dimensions, I don't know. But, you know, again, there's been a real productive explosion of geometrical thinking in, um, in real science, and it was starting right at this time that fantastic writers like H.G. Wells were letting their thinking explode, I think for the same reasons. Hmm. So, so I, uh, my background, my academic background is in psychology, so naturally I was drawn to the distinction between real or absolute time and perceived time. And uh, I wonder if you talk a little bit about that. Do, do, in, is time the same for you and me and people on the other side of the universe, or is it mutable? You know, again, yes, no. Um, <laughs> well, first of all, the difference, we've, we, we humans have understood for approximately 400 years that there's a difference between psychological time and what you could call real time, actually maybe longer than that. Even Shakespeare talks, Shakespeare talks about um, how our sense of time varies from moment to moment, depending on our mood or what we're doing. People certainly knew that. And then it was Isaac Newton who said, time is absolute and let's put psychological time aside. I'm going to define time in a mathematical way, time t, I need it for my equations, it is absolute, it flows everywhere equably and the same. And, the, and he insisted, based on no particular evidence, I would say, that it's the same everywhere in the universe, and let's just treat it that way as absolute and universal. And fine, that worked really great, as everybody knows, until Einstein. Um, and Einstein, changed that and discovered that there is some slippage. And maybe not as much slippage as we tend to think. I tend to feel, and you don't have to consider me an authority on this, this could be a matter of prejudice, I tend to feel that Einstein was himself very much supporting Newton's the, dis the main distinction Newton was making, which was between psychological time and real time. Mm -hmm. um, we use the word real time to mean something else now. But, but Einstein, too, needed time to be something abstract, very precise, very mathematical. The difference was there isn't just one clock for the entire universe. There are different clocks all over the place. And if you start to move quickly, your clock is moving at a different speed from somebody who is not moving at all. And so weird things happen, and that immediately pl starts playing into time travel science fiction. You know, I remember one of my favorite stories when I was a kid. I bet you read this one. What was the name of the book where they're twins? <coughs> twins. Oh, Time Enough. Uh, 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 yes, I know the one. Time, um, time, 
Robert Heinlein. Yes. So there are twins, and one of them, and they, there's telepathy, you have to believe in that too. So they have a special way of communicating, and one of them goes off to space, and one of them stays home, and the one who goes off to space stays young, while the one who stays home ages quickly, and that is all scientifically correct, according to Einstein. Yep. Yes, I do know that book. In fact, I, I'm, a, I'm a little embarrassed to say that I read it again from time to time. <laughs> But I take some, uh, some solace, again, from your book, which I didn't know about, Nabokov describing the need to read a book more than once in order to fully appreciate it, because when you read it the first time, you're reading it linearly, whereas to understand, to understand all its nuance, like when you look at a picture, you don't have to look at it from the one beginning to the end. So the book is linear in time, but it's meant to be treated as a whole work of art. And yeah. so as you become more and more familiar with it, new bits appear to you. And that's unquestionably true. But Nabokov also says something that I don't agree with. Um, I mean, he's wonderful on the subject of time, another, another great fiction writer who really gets obsessed with time. But he says, if I understand him correctly, that, that therefore the, the only true way, the best way to understand a book is to have it in your mind all at once. When you finally, let's say, have the book memorized, if that's possible, if you know the entire book, then you understand the book. There are no more surprises. And I don't think that's right. That doesn't correspond to my experience of reading, first of all. I don't think you can ever get to that point. And if you did get to that point, I think it would take away essential elements of books, of stories, which are anticipation, surprise, not knowing what's coming next, being driven forward by the desire to know what's, com what's coming next. You still make connections between what you discover and what you already knew, and then there's a kind of satisfaction. But uh, I think if you ever get to the point where the whole book is in your head all at once, it takes, it kind of destroys it as a work of art. In the, in, it's kind of in the same way that if you imagined a piece of music, if you were the <coughs> kind of being who didn't listen to music linearly but could kind of magically absorb it all at once, wouldn't that destroy something essential about the experience because it's about time, because time is its medium and its subject. It's true. Um, I said I would take questions from the floor if anybody would like to come up and ask, or otherwise I'm doing pretty well. You have to come up to the microphone so that we can hear you. And uh, here it comes. It's a race. <laughs> I guess we'll start here. Uh, my first uh, comment is on uh, the memorization of a book, as you were just discussing. Uh, I've had the opportunity to read books, you know, 10 years ago. I read a lot of science fiction. I read a book 10 years ago. I read it today. It's a different book. It's not because the book's changed. It's because I've changed. So that's something about not, you know, memorizing a book doesn't lose anything. Even if I knew all the words, it's still not the same book. But I had a, a question about writing. If you're writing about the past and you're time traveling into the past, you kind of know why you're going into the past. You'd like to have a conversation with Abraham Lincoln or you would like to see dinosaurs or some writing that says you have a destination in mind. If you're writing for the future, you have to make the destination up. So how do you look at writing uh, time travel when you're going forward and backward, I view it as two different things, and I'd, I'd like your opinion on that. Yeah, there, I think it's true that they are f fundamentally two different things. You know, there are two kinds of people in the world, people who like to divide the world into, in half and people who see it whole. <laughs> but, but, but you're right, there's a, there's a very clear distinction between time travel to the future and the past, and yet they do have things in common. And there are kinds of time travel f stories where people go both ways. 
where they try out each of the possibilities. The, you know, start, if we're starting at the beginning, there was, um, there was Mark Twain sending his guy to medieval England. In his case, it wasn't to enable Mark Twain to tell us something new that we didn't know about medieval England. But that later became a big motivation for time travel stories about the past. Um, time travel fiction, for, well, there's Sherman and Peabody on Rocky and Bullwinkle. <laughs> uh, I'm, I take that very seriously. You know, it's, a, it's an educational device, even though in the case of, of Sherman and Peabody, you remember it's, it's Mr. Sherman and his pet, dog. that's a dog, dog, and his pet human Peabody. Usually the past they go to is not <laughs> historically accurate. <laughs> anyway, no. I, I shouldn't go on and on about this, but you're right. Then H.G. Wells is imagining the future and he's inventing a future that does not exist. And you have to, then, then you watch writers making uh, s the most profound kind of choices. And of course, the, the first one is, is this a utopian future where everybody is happy and you have a moral lesson about how great a society could work? Or is it a dystopian future where you're expressing some kind of terrible fear or some kind of warning like 1984 or Brave New World. And I think if we counted them up, we would discover that our great writers prefer dystopian mm -hmm. futures. Okay, thank you for your question. I'd like to ask a question about um, the limitations of language, but before I do, I'm, I'm struck by one of the last things you talked about before questions was listening to music or experiencing music and about the experience of it all at once. I, I believe Mozart indicated at some point in his life that he heard the notes all together, all at once. And uh, I think that the, the problem and the difficulty of that concept is about the limitations of language. You have him talk about sort of what we call the arrow of time. But of course, our language is limited by talking about going back and going forward. And obviously there are theories of time that it's all happening at once, but even talking about it as happening at once is a problem of language. So could you address that issue of language? Yeah, that's a really, that's a really good question and it's something I'm, I'm very interested in and try to deal with here and there in the book. Um, it's impossible to separate the way we think about time from the words we use. And, and, it, and it's, so it's interesting to focus on that and to kind of try to subtract things that are linguistic accidents from reality. As soon as you start talking about time as a fourth dimension, um, right from the beginning, you have to wonder to what extent were people influenced by words that we use for space and time, maybe just because there aren't enough words to go around. You know, one thing is before another, one thing is well, if you say after, that's definitely a time word. But if you say before, that could be a time word or a space word. And um, then you discover problems. You discover, not problems, you discover interesting quirks where different languages treat time quite differently. And you have to recognize that your own language is causing you to be prejudiced in various ways. If I ask the people in this room, to point to the future, I'm gonna guess that almost everybody would do something like this, point forward. Because we Westerners, especially speaking English, but most of other Western languages, think the future is ahead of us. It lies ahead. But believe, believe me when I tell you that there are quite a few cultures where people think it's just as obvious, it is just as obvious that the future is there. That's the future because uh, I can't see it. And this is the past because I can see it pretty clearly. Uh, th that might be a, an oversimplification of their reason. But again, um, it has to do with words. And in Mandarin, the directionality of time tends to be vertical, not horizontal. They think of time being above and below, the past and the future are above and below. I'm not a Mandarin speaker, mm. uh, so don't press me for details. But, but these things are, I could go on and on. Do you spend time? Do you waste time? Do you pass the time? All, all when you 
you have to admit, metaphors and not accurate. And, and speaking of time, I'm used to working in studios I'm, 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 where there's like a zillion clocks telling me how we're doing, but I haven't gotten very, um, so I'm looking to my boss. That's what I was thinking <laughs> to my wife. I'm so sorry um, to the people in line that I'm rambling on. Yeah, well, it, I, I think the, yeah. It, so it's, one it's, more, two more? One, one more quick one, yes. All right. <clears throat> Although quick ones are not okay, really happening. Okay, I'll, I'll try to make this fast. I've, I've loved your books in the past, all right, for one thing. Um, I'm a little on the fence about this one because uh, I, I, I don't know where this book is going. I don't know that much about it because it's brand new. Uh, is, is this book about uh, the fantasy thoughts of time travel? Time travel is a real science because time traveling in the future, you know, right on. Because, you know, the faster you go, I mean, the, you know, the t time does uh, slow down. All right, or, or actually speed up anyway, slow down for wherever you left. Well, anyway, but time traveling in the past just seems kind of ridiculous because uh, it's just, I mean, it just, it's just not practical. But so what is the book? What's my book about? Yeah, exactly. What a, what a great question yeah. to wrap up. We haven't right. said what the book's right. about. What's the book about? The book is about the idea of time travel in our culture, how it has developed, how it enriches the way we think about things, but here's what the book is not about. It's not about how to do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I cannot, I can't really help you there. And it, it's not so much about any science of time travel because as far as I'm concerned, there isn't a lot of real science of time travel yet. And, well, <laughs> and, and, and now we have to run. Okay, um, Th thank you thank, all so thank much. Thank you all very much. I'm really happy to be here. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.